welcome to Wisdom for Life, where we sit through philosophy and find practical advice that you can use in your everyday life. Hi, I'm Dan Hayes, and I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Greg Sadler. Today, we're going to be talking about... The Topic of Truth, Take Two. And so this is kind of a holdover from our last session, which was also a holdover from the session before that. I hope we don't get into an infinite loop here of doing <laughs> more and more of these. But the Topic of Truth, there's so much to it that we weren't able to delve into it to our satisfaction. We do have to do a bit of work, I think, because it sounds rather abstract, right? But, you know, I think we can provide you with a lot of examples and a lot of insights that do relate to our everyday life. And so we've got a lot of uh, topics yet to cover in this, but I thought we would do a little bit of review for those who might be listening for the first time or who have uh, forgotten what we talked about last time. Um, So this, as I said, is a carryover of a carryover. We did a a session a while back on memory and truth, and Dan and I had thought that we would blaze our way through it and get done with that quickly. And instead (laughs) we said, oh, we have to do a whole session on the topic of truth. And then again, we thought we would get through all the topics that we wanted. And we, what did we get through about maybe half of them at best? (laughs) Uh, Our our thoughts that we would get through them. It was not a true thought at all. It was No, you're right. (laughs) (laughs) It did not correspond to the reality of our actual getting through these things. Not at all. And and actually, we probably should have known better, which would have, you know, tied in in certain ways to the, the co- coherence theory of truth. We could have looked at, you know, previous times in which we did stuff and said, this proposition that we're going to get through all these topics, that can't be true given what we know about how we interact and... <laughs> Go the fact that we engine. almost never get through all of our uh, material anyways. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it is better to have too much than oh, not yeah. enough, right? Absolutely. I think we've, we've done quite well with the, <laughs> the way that we kind of pick and choose and uh, prune as we go. That's true, yeah. But it, not um, a lot of times do we actually go, oh man, we just need to keep on digging into it and thus... You were here at third time's maybe, charm. Maybe, yeah. maybe not. Well, I, and I think we we talked before we got started that we'll probably also take up this topic of truth in some more contemporary ways. Um, mm-hmm. Talking about some people may remember the 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 um, what was it? Not not a, it's an adjective. Truthiness, right? Yeah. Or no, that but, would be a, that would be a noun, right? Substantive. Um, that got coined during the Bush era. Uh, is talking, that a Stephen Colbert? I believe I think it, was, I think it was, yeah. yeah. On the, when he was back on the Colbert Report. That's right, yeah, yeah. Or was was it? Did he start talking about that on the Daily Show? Because that's, mm. I think that's where he had his start, right? All I know is it was that persona that uh, that Stephen Colbert persona. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, so there's a lot of other things to talk about. Some people say we live in a post-truth era. Um, certainly the last four years have been quite a time for that. Um, so I, I think we, we'll probably pick this up again next time, talking a little bit more about um, truth in politics and the marketplace of ideas. But for right now, we, we want to go further into talking about theories of truth and perspectives on truth. Um, we, we actually started last time just to review a little bit with some popular sayings about truth and what they reveal, including the ever popular, you can't handle the truth. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we, we discussed uh, some different modalities, you could call them, logical, empirical, or experiential, moral, um, we, we did spend a good bit of time talking about two traditionally uh, philosophically understood theories, the correspondence theory of truth and the coherence theory of truth. And then we ended with a little bit of a teaser about the pragmatic theory of truth. And uh, there was a quip that you had at the end of that. I'm trying to remember it. Uh, I think you asked whether that was practical to do or not. Uh, Does that ring a bell? Uh, I don't know. It's probably something that's is it practical to even start getting into this without actually getting fully into it, or 
maybe not having the time to to really explore it. Yeah. Yeah. So but we're that, gonna make more, good on that today, right? Yeah, right. That's more semantics than anything. It's me just messing with words, because the actual truth of the matter is when we actually talk about um pragmatism, there you know there is a definitely a preconceived notion of this being practical and what it actually is, which is more. A lot more, especially if you, depending on the uh, pragmatic uh, philosopher, that's actually the one that's talking. Because yeah, as with like existentialism, what is existentialism oh, yeah. kind of depends on on who you're talking. Which to. Which existentialist you talk to? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's that's quite true. And I think that we could say that there's a lot of this is a bit of a, a digression. There's a lot of philosophical terms that have come to take on meanings that are sometimes diametrically opposed to what they originally started with. I mean, Dan and I are both members of the Milwaukee Stoic Fellowship. We're both co-organizers. And there is this distinction that has come to be made recently between uppercase S stoicism, the actual philosophy, and then lowercase S you know, stoicism, the stiff upper lip and, you know, the the idea of like, say, repressing your emotions. Well, that's the lowercase s. That's not real stoicism. Mm -hmm. And you could say this about cynicism and utilitarianism. It's it's almost as if any. Epicureanism. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Epicureans don't just stuff their face full Mm -hmm. of full of stuff um, and get drunk all the time. Um, I I, kind of think that with a lot of these, there's a tendency once a term has a popular, what do we call it, you know, popular use, popular acceptance, it starts to migrate away from the original term. Now, could we talk about that in terms of a loss or lack of truth? Is it, is it false, for example, to, let's take Epicureans, right? So mm-hmm. Epicureans, if you actually read Epicte- Epicurus, sorry, um, <laughs> he, he doesn't think that you should be indulging yourself an awful lot, an awful lot in physical pleasures. You know, he, he thought that having a little nice cheese and bread was good. Um, you don't need to drink a lot. You don't need to have a lot of sex. Um, we nowadays associate Epicureanism most, not so much with sex, but I think with, with food and drink. Right. And so we have journals that are devoted to that for foodies. Mm -hmm. Is there a kind of lack or loss of truth that's taken place as the term has migrated in its meaning? What do you think? For Epicureanism Uh, or in general? We, I mean, we could let me put you on the spot for both then. <laughs> okay, well, first, <laughs> absolutely, one. you know, uh, Epicureanism usually just gets wrapped up in its like the base idea of like hedonism, but like hedonism even has a worse rap than Epicureanism. And True, yeah. I think of, um, oh, the uh, hedonism bot from Futurama. <laughs> which is a character who is just is yeah. like, oh, this is lovely, as he gorges himself and like slathers himself with butter. You know, it's just it is like this pure, just like uh, to excess hedonism, which is, you know, if you go to, um, I think one of the my favorite like ideas of kind of de- defining ep- uh, Epicurean and hedonism is uh, to understand a a pond that is very very calm and there's no peaks nor valleys within that lake and that would be kind of like your ideal um within epicureanism um you know it feels good you're you're trying to make sure that you're you're not having the bads you know and as well as if you know you eat too much then it also feels bad so also you're trying right. to yeah. not get those things as well so a a calm and smooth pond is uh, at least the understanding that i have of it that i feel is closer to this kind of idea of hedonism and then in general um yeah uh, things things move all the time and i think as we'll get into in our next discussion especially when we talk about like uh truth and politics and that nature is where we're you know people because uh, as we've been talking about we have a whole bunch of different kind of base ideas of what truth is there's these right, right. philosophical uh groupings that uh, define truth in certain ways under certain manners and 
uh, people are using the same word truth, but they tend to um, be speaking past each other because they, the foundations by which they are defining their truth aren't always the same. Yeah, and there's, there's often a problem with, you could call it not enough truth, right? There's just enough truth to get you into trouble. You tell a story and this part's true mm -hmm. and another part over here is true, but the stuff connecting them up turns out to be, if not completely false, at least, you know, dubious. And, you know, when somebody fall, somebody's faulted for that, they fall back on, well, but, but look over here, this, this, uh, this one part is true. And you say, yeah, that's, that's, that's fine. But the story you're telling is a false narrative. Mm -hmm. um, I think that happens an, an awful lot in, not just in politics, but in, in culture in general. Um, you know, when we think about who's, who's going to be uh, lauded or praised and who's going to be condemned or criticized, um, two of the main functions of, you know, our moral language. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, how we organize things, how we prioritize things, Truth can be an issue with those. So that should lead us to talking. We're, we're going to do a little bit of review for you. Um, we talked a lot about these two theories of truth that often get brought up in philosophy textbooks or encyclopedia entries or um, people teaching intro classes, a correspondence theory of truth and a coherence theory of truth. Do you want to do a quick sum up of, of those before we talk a little bit about why they matter or what do you think oh uh, yeah so we've got um correspondence kind of in a simple thing that which comports with reality so if i i take my teacup here and i i drop it Don't uh, do and that. I, <laughs> um the the if i were to try to create a function that would describe how this would happen and it actually does that well my prediction now uh, predicts what actually happens in testable in the physical world, then that would be corresponding to the reality of the world that we're you know, extensively living in. Okay. Um, and so what's the coherence theory then? What, how does uh, that differ? And so um, coherence requires a, um, a whole that works w together in... Um, I don't want to use coherent. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's one of the, the, the tricky things, though, right? It, we talk about truth, and we're often using the words true and false to describe them. It's very difficult to get away from these circular types of um, yeah. characterizations, right? Um, I guess uh, maybe a good way to say it is a um, a map of reality that has no... Um, Oh, we were just talking about it with uh, time machines. Um, oh, no oh, paradoxes. No paradoxes. Right? Yeah. Or, or contradictions. You contradictions say. or paradoxes, yes. Yeah. I guess I'd say a paradox is a contradiction set to a an extra level. Yeah, a special kind of contradiction. Right? Yeah. Well, I, mean, I, I guess, I mean, I think this this takes us a little bit out of our topic, but there's different kinds of paradoxes, and some people distinguish between like paradoxes proper, which is what, what you're talking about mm -hmm. there, and then there's other things that it just seems counterintuitive, but it turns out to be turns out to be the case. So, yeah. and, and these are two different senses of the term paradox. Um, yeah, I, I guess I think of like the whole idea of was that um, was it Zeno's arrow uh, where moving oh, right where, where it's, it's shot and it, it's um it has to go through half the distance before exactly. it goes through um and to go half the distance it needs to go half of the half of the distance and then half of the that distance and it was you know and how you can never, you have never motion? actually have the, the the arrow hitting the target right yeah and it, it like well there is no motion then because yeah how yeah. if it goes ad infinitum to the end then you never get there and i, I think we solved that finally with calculus um, well, no, Aristotle pointed out the problem with that already oh. back then. He said, listen, you're abstracting away from time. 
Mm -hmm. um, it, it takes you half as long to get to the next point as, you know, the, the previous thing. Uh -huh. And pretty soon you're there. Because <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you get an infinitesimally small amount of time to move yeah. an infinitesimally small amount of grace. Which, yeah. which you cross, you know. Yeah. And, oh. and then suddenly, boom, the arrow is in the target. Or what were the other ones? There was Achilles and the tortoise. Achilles does catch the tortoise. Mm -hmm. There was that weird one about the uh, two chariots, I think it is, that are like approaching each other in the arena um yeah Arist Arist actually it's because of aristotle i think if i remember right that we actually do have the zeno's paradoxes that we currently possess because zeno is supposed to have written more but nobody nobody managed to keep track of them mm. if if i remember the story right um so i, I just like oh, love that idea of like okay this guy, he's like, oh, he's thinking about some things, and he's like, well, this seems really weird. And he starts writing them, and he keeps like, well, I'm going to keep on writing and writing and writing. And he starts like passing them out. Can you understand this? Can you understand this? <laughs> Just, he, he's in the, the marketplace. He's like, hey, this is really weird. Well, you know, uh, Zeno's reason for, for coming up with the paradoxes is he was a student of Parmenides, and Parmenides claimed that there was no motion. Mm -hmm. And which is, you know, that's pretty counterintuitive. <laughs> and <laughs> Parmenides claimed a whole bunch of other things, too, where we're like, yeah, I don't know about that. You know, Th does but that correspond with reality? <laughs> that's where it gets really interesting. I think, strictly speaking, you couldn't have <clears throat> you couldn't use the correspondence theory for Parmenides because he's talking about these things like being or you know motion or, or justice and um, and he's, he's basically saying everything is is one thing um, and that thought and being are the same now how would you possibly compare a statement like that except to say well this is just this can't be the way things are it doesn't correspond to anything how do you take a statement like that and map it against the reality that we were looking at because we could be wrong maybe maybe you and i are the same thing and all of our listeners are the same thing and you know we're we're, we're just stuck in an illusion here which is parmenides basic take um right i think you'd have to have a correspondence approach rather and say does this does this make sense together mm -hmm. you know uh, you mean a, a coherence Oh, right. Sorry. Yeah. Coherence theory. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, uh, yeah. And I think he was created, trying to create a, a coherent set of axioms. On. Yeah. If not axioms, at least statements. Um, it's, it's, I mean, and this is very paradoxical as well, because um, Parmenides wrote this in the form of a poem, which has like characters in it. He meets a goddess and the goddess reveals this to him. And, you know, when, when you think about that, you're like, well, wait a second. If what the goddess revealed to you is actually true, then there wasn't any goddess and there wasn't any you. It, it, we're all just like one single thing thinking this this basic thought. So why did you put it in the form of a poem? <laughs> is it for all of us dummies that can't, you know, get straight philosophy or were you just showing off or <laughs> what's yeah. the deal, Parmenides, you know? Yeah. Well, going but... on with, with, <laughs> with this, so, you know, both coherence and uh, correspondence, they're, you know, reputable theories of truth. A, a lot of people who have espoused these over the history of ideas going all the way back to Plato and Aristotle. And they do capture something that's really essential to our everyday lives. As Dan was just pointing out, you know, making claims about cups and what happens if they fall or if there's tea in the cup or, you know, uh, rocket fuel or pick whatever else you want. Those are things that we can, you know, we, we know how to solve those. If I say, I have got a million dollars in the bank, you can go and check my bank accounts. And as it turns out, no, that's that's not the case at all. Um, with co with the, <laughs> the coherence theory of truth, <laughs> we, you know, we map things onto each other. That's often how we figure out cases where we can't directly look at stuff. We say, well, does this make sense with the stuff that we know over here and we do a lot of our living in that way neither one of them is completely adequate they don't provide us with everything that we need to grasp 
truth, but they're both useful in a lot of scenarios and, and situations. And considered as theories, they both give us answers to, you know, we talk about philosophy as being about the big questions, right? So a big question, what is truth? What does it mean for something to actually be true or false? What makes it true or false? And I, I think that, you know, we don't want to throw these out for the next shiny thing. Right? Mm -hmm. These are, you know, tested and, and true. Again, we're using that kind of a facetious way. Um, theories that, that help us express what we mean by truth. I mean, I think that, let me bounce an idea off of you. As human beings, no matter where we grow up, no matter what kind of situation we're in, whether we've ever heard of philosophical theories of truth or not, we inevitably use both the correspondence theory and the coherence theory to make sense out of our lives. What, what do you think? Yes, in and we do it in different ways. I guess, you know, it okay. depends, depends on the person as well. Um, yeah. Uh, a lot of times, like, we're going to be talking about things that don't actually exist, but we oh. want to try to make some truths about yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. Um, then, then there has to be some... Uh, like there's something there's nothing you can like test it against, and so like you know what is justice as yeah. as an individual idea? Can, can there be a truth that actually corresponds to something that you know only really kind of collectively lives within our brains? Um, and then and then there are certain things that are like partially real but then we do have some ways of testing them but they're also kind of like shaking their foundation so i think of like economics yeah. here and so we've got all this money and interaction and it's it's based on the the general way that people interact with each other um based on certain axioms but all uh, these axioms don't always hold and because we're these really fickle creatures um even the the best models usually have you know you can't like predict the stock market at least so far we can't predict the stock market maybe if we had um uh oh what's that demon i was just thinking about him um they'll come to me later um if we had a a, a ability to know every single movement of every single atom in the universe and like you knew everything was going to happen oh, laplace's some... demon thank you yeah. laplace's demon um yeah <laughs> Maybe you could um, potentially uh, predict that, but it, there's just yeah. there's so many factors that are outside of our ability to actually ascertain that it is at least a fool's errand to say that there's going to be absolutes. You might be have like you know within you know twenty point range you can make some predictions, but they go particularly bad over especially long periods of time. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting when you're talking about something like the stock market, right? It's supposed to be representing value of, well, you know, broadly speaking, these organizational units that we call companies. And there is a predictive factor to it, like you're pointing out. Like, you know, back in the day, you bought stock not just to swap it and sell it really quickly, but because it was going to pay dividends. And you're kind of you're kind of guessing or betting on certain things. And you might know certain factors, like, you know, um, you're buying up, I don't know. Um, well, right. So right now, <laughs> interestingly, we were talking about this beforehand. Um, Donald Trump has... Um, started some lawsuits, some class action lawsuits against the big tech companies. Who who are the top market cap companies? Well, at least, um, you know, Google and Facebook are. Twitter isn't yet. Twitter's kind of in the second tier. Uh, and those are the three companies. And, you know, we can look at that and we can say, oh, man, should I buy um, Facebook or should I sell Facebook based on that? And, you know, if I had any money to spend on that, I would probably buy it at this point in time because I expect that the lawsuits are going to be tossed and that might actually have a positive effect. But, you know, we're, we're doing this kind of prediction and we, and we do so bringing together all these factors that 
we are dealing with as matters of real abstraction. I mean, we we can't, you know, there, there's no way in which we can like look into Apple as a company or Amazon as a company and see all the different things that are going on. We have to engage in these these abstractions that um, get get provided to us in, in myriad ways, and then we see whether they cohere, whether they make sense, mm-hmm. and very often the decisions that we're making, whether it be that or whether we you know whether we're taking a job somewhere, whether we go and date somebody or marry them, or um, you know whether we have kids or don't have kids. These these are not based on like knowing the reality of everything, and and uh, having a you know pure correspondence between the things things outside and the factors yet to come and our minds or our, our language, we have to rely quite often on something like a coherence theory of truth. And we pick and choose things and we're like, well, this thing that we used to believe, that's out. Mm-hmm. But this thing over here, we're going we're gonna to double down on that one and we're going to bring this new one in. It's sort of like having a, a circle of friends and you can only have, I don't know, 10 of them in the elevator or something. And you're like, that, th- this guy's coming in. Somebody else get out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, bringing out the stock market is, is really interesting for, you know, as you said, it's ostensibly about like the, the value of the stock should correspond yeah. or like it, it, it should have some relation to the actual value that the company is providing. Yeah, but then, yeah. But then you also see... Uh, These bubbles that happen, right? <laughs> big bubbles, like the 90s, yeah. we had the big bubble. And also, like, right now there's, um, like, the meme stocks. We've got our game stock, we've got our AMC. <laughs> and, and so that's, like, who knows if, if what the heck GameStop is actually valued at, but there's a whole bunch of people that are buying it but partially because they believe that it's going to hurt someone else. These big, um, uh, certain uh, traders Inst- on uh, institutional traders yeah. on Wall Street um, because they've got shorts on them, and so like, well, if they can't pay the shorts, they have to pay us. You know, that that has totally thrown out the you know, is GameStop actually worth it? No, yeah. it, it that doesn't hold anymore whatsoever, and it's getting a lot of people angry. Because they are using a stock market in a way that does not um, agree with that idea of what the truth of stock is supposed to represent. You know, there's another wrinkle as well that we can add to this. So, you know, whenever anything happens um, that's considered a big deal, somebody will produce a TV show or movie about it. And... So, you know, like terrible crimes take place, right? We have a whole, you know, uh, let's talk about murders and, and rapes and financial mis- misdeeds over here. You know, they, they get turned into Dateline episodes or whatever. And we also have all these other things that have to do with, um, you know, like the you mentioned financial crisis. So there was one about the 2008 housing crisis that led to the, the meltdown that we're still recovering from today. Mm-hmm. The big short. I think there have been a couple different like that. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Now with GameStop, the, the cycle has gotten so um, fast and close that there were, with even, the, even before all of this stuff was being sorted out, there were already people putting together proposals and scripts about what would be you know, the next movie about this. Now here's, so here's two questions to think about. Um, and I don't actually have any good answer about these. So when we, when we see these movies, right, whether they're <clears throat> about financial things or like think about Aaron Brockovich, you know, just the sheer fact that Hollywood has put money into it and it's been fit into this nice 90 minute sequence, you know that there's some some things that are going to be false, right? And, mm-hmm. and when you go online, you find out that, yeah, most of these um, based on a true story movies are like way divergent from the truth of, of what was actually going on. And maybe that's partly due to the fact that they think we're, we're dummies and, you know, we like, you know, happy, sappy stuff. Or maybe it's just the format of things or maybe there's too few people working on this, this sort of thing. It must but conform with, to a three-act structure. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that they have that sort of thing in mind, right? Yeah. Now, there's some things that are easier to portray in a way that would like correspond to something, like you know, people getting sick from, say, fracking water. You know, 
Um, but trying to make a movie about buying and selling stocks, you know, I mean, you could do it with things like Boiler Room that, that had like a, a Vin Diesel in it and a few other people where you show people selling crappy stocks to people mm-hmm. and basically, you know, like ruining these people's lives by getting them to invest their, their life savings in it. But that's that's a certain picture. Does it correspond to a reality? I don't know. I mean, I don't know people in like, Boiler Rooms. Um, but but with yeah. this sort of thing, like the game, the game uh, uh, stop. stop thing, how do you make a movie about that that actually corresponds to anything? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and people would watch, right? And there, there's so many actors that you can't, like, say, like, I guess there's, there's one guy, <laughs> oh, what is his name? Um, big effing value, I think his name is. Um, uh, really? <laughs> yeah, at least that, that's his. That's his uh, Reddit user tagline. Name. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so he was the, the the guy that like put out, um, basically that everything was shorted way over what it should be. And so here, here's a really interesting segue. Okay. Um, GameStop as pragmatic truth. They don't care about what the stock market is supposed to be. Yeah. They are only uh, caring about that the fact that they saw that someone was very leveraged on this, and if the price went up, they had to pay out. Okay. And so they knew the rules of the system, and that certain people were over leveraged and if they can convince enough other people to also buy into this they would all basically make out so it wasn't they totally threw out the basic idea of like you know uh stock value being a representation of the value of the company like no we we can just we we know the rules these contracts come up and then they have to pay them out yeah. And so it works. Uh, we 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 got our money, and we also took it from like the big Wall Street guys who, you know, uh, if you hadn't noticed, are are not very well liked around the country. Yeah, and so there's sort of a double motive there, right? Let's make some money, but let's also stick it to this group of people, and and either one of them could be a sufficient motive, I I suppose, right? Mm-hmm. Um, like even if they didn't make that much money, so long as the the hated Wall Street guys um, got theirs, you know, mm-hmm. got got their comeuppance. That might be sufficient to to do that. Well, let's talk about the pragmatic theory of truth. That's something we brought up last time and got to mention a little bit. Um, it's it's a bit more complex than it is often portrayed as. Um, so, you know, there's soundbite characterizations of, of it, and some of these soundbites, actually a lot of these soundbites, are attributable to one of the main pragmatist philosophers, William James, also a psychologist, um, and, and, you know, brother of Henry James, the novelist. Um, so doesn't some, it just mean being practical, Greg? Well, so that, that goes back to what we were talking about before, right? There's the popular or... Um, what, what else should we call it? The, um, the common the, usage? Yeah, the ordinary usage, right? If I say, let's be pragmatic, you know, um, how much are how much can we actually talk about on this show? You know, uh, maybe then it is just a substitute for being practical. Um, or, you know, uh, what else? What, what would be some other practical things you and I have decided about, about the show at different points? Uh you know, should we have an intro and outro? Yeah, well, there you, you know, go. People like, people like to hear that kind of stuff, so um, maybe we should do that. It's a practical thing to do. And you could say, well, that, that makes it true in, in the sense that you can say you ought to have an intro and outro. Mm-hmm. It becomes a true statement because, yeah, it works, right? Yeah, or, or the fact that we actually have, like, notes. That's that's very important. <laughs> I don't know that you and I could just sit here and riff back and forth like some people do on on podcasts. Yeah. For... So, it's, so it's it's practical for us for the way that we do this particular podcast. That's yeah yeah. So that that's a good example. Um, and going back to these sound bites, there's a lot of them out there. You know, truth is what works. That that's a kind of famous one. Um, truth is what is useful. Actually, that. 
that's got a, a longer tail going back into the history of of ideas. Um, I think the utilitarians can sometimes be, you know, talked about in, in that respect. James had this thing, the cash value of ideas, and that was a slogan that not only represented pragmatism in a certain way, but also made everybody overseas who didn't like Americans, because they thought Americans were much too money-oriented and didn't have any culture. They were like, yeah, see those Americans, pragmatism is their philosophy. They're all about the cash value of ideas. No respect for history, no respect for culture, no, no respect for anything else. Um, these are, you know, these actually do have their um, origin within works of pragmatist philosophers, but they lose something in being pulled out of that, that context. So you might say they lose some of their, some of their truth, right? Um, some of the, the coherence that's there. We, we actually picked out a couple different um, definitions from online dictionaries and encyclopedias that we thought we would kick around. So there's one was uh, an approach that assesses the truth or meaning of theories or beliefs in terms of the, su the success of their practical application. That's not bad, right? Yeah. Um, what do you think? Can this, yes. can this work for a definition of what it means to be true? That is definitely a definition. Um, I think yeah. you could... There's definitely things that are left out, like what is determined as success here. Yeah, oh, uh, that's a big one. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> um, and and what is, I guess, the practical application of them? Uh, I feel like they're, yeah. they're, that is a little bit less defined, at least in my immediate looking at it. Yeah. I mean, you could also have cases where you make a decision or you commit in a certain way to a belief and you do have good grounds for holding that belief, but it doesn't lead to success, mm -hmm. right? Or it doesn't lead to the success that you, you want it to, to display. Um, even, even putting aside the question, well, what is success? Um, right. Let, let's say you actually do have a good, solid understanding of it. Does that actually mean that the belief itself isn't true? I mean, you might say, well, you back up and you do an after action assessment or you, whatever it is that you're going to, you're going to look at and you figure out, okay, where did I go wrong? And maybe there are some false beliefs lurking in the background, but that doesn't mean necessarily that the belief that you're operating on by itself is false yeah it kind of reminds me of this um misattribution thing of uh you know when in during the summer uh ice cream sales go up as well as the <laughs> um shark attacks go up doesn't mean that they are actually directly related they're both related to the fact that they happen yeah. during summer um and so you could believe something um but it and you think doing it or, or doing something at a certain time um, gets you that the outcome that you want, and it might actually get the outcome you want, yeah, but it yeah. wouldn't actually be the thing that is actually causing that thing, even though, you know, this is kind of like, um, oh, oh, like, doing some, like, I don't know, rain dance, or, or some okay. other... And and you do it like you. I'm assuming because you go through a ceremony that you've actually influenced the cosmos in some way. Right. Yeah. Um, and and maybe you just know that you've always done it when the days get so long, and that happens to be just before spring when it starts to rain a lot. And so, yeah. you know, who knows? You know, there, there's a number of different things of hey, these things tend to work out in the way that they were working out, but why are they actually working out? Yeah. We don't understand the causality behind them, and we misattribute mm -hmm. you know, what's causing what, right? Mm -hmm. Well, let's look at the next one, then. So Wikipedia has a philosophical tradition that considers words and thought as tools and instruments for prediction, problem-solving, and action, and rejects the idea that the function of thought is to describe, represent, or mirror reality. I would say that's actually... Um, not bad if we have in mind a later pragmatist like Richard Rorty, who has this book, The Mirror of Nature, in which he says, you know, 
people think that truth is all about um, you know getting things right a correspondence theory of, uh, of, of truth and that's just not what's really going on and he uses um, he draws on three different traditions he draws on uh, John Dewey, the pragmatist or instrumentalist philosopher, he draws on Martin Heidegger, and he draws on uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein, and he says, "Look, they're all they're all basically saying the same kind of thing. You know, we we can never have a mirror of nature. We can never really get the world as it is. Instead, what we <clears throat> what we have are like projects that we we try to do, and and being true is you know like when." when we're able to uh, bring them off or when they correspond to our needs. So, you know, prediction, problem solving, and action. Oh, okay, I think that that's, I mean, it doesn't describe all of pragmatism, mm -hmm. but the, the idea that words and thought are tools and instruments, <clears throat> that sounds very much like John Dewey, you know? Yeah. Uh... What, do, is there something about this one that you don't like? Because I can see. Well, some uh, I guess I, turning. I, I, <laughs> I, I do uh, tend to go a little bit closer towards uh, the correspondence than any of these. Okay. Um, but um, there are definitely lots. Uh, like, you can get a long way with this, and especially yeah. if you don't happen to have all the tools at your disposal to get to a perfect representation of reality, um, then this is definitely a good way to go about that. As well as it, it as you're just saying, like this whole idea of mirroring reality, um, whenever we are making a representation of reality, we'll never be able to perfectly represent it. This is the... And, and even if we did, how would we know? right? We'd have to have the reality in front of us and all of its complexity and then our representation, mm -hmm. which presumably is also part of that reality. And then we'd map them on to each other. Um, yeah. How do we do that? Uh, and then, and that's the whole idea of the, um, the map is not the terrain. Whenever you're making yeah. a map, uh, there's always going to be some loss of information. Now we're, we're talking about abstractions. And so now our abstractions are like atomic units when we're actually talking about thought here or a uh, truth and the if you're abstracting and making arguments from abstractions there's always going to be a loss or it's going to be a lossy uh truth but it might work and if that's yeah. more useful then well that's probably use or like that is a an end that i could see as valuable I'll give you an example of what you're talking about that actually happens in the world of ideas and in um, teaching and, and learning. So, you know, when we have textbooks or when we have kind of um, second rate um, histories of ideas or stuff like that, they put everything into nice, neat boxes, right? So, you know, in, in the uh, early modern period, we had the continental rationalists and the British empiricists, and empiricists all believe X, Y, Z, and rationalists believe to the contrary, A, B, C. And so when you, when you, you know, have that sort of map, essentially, a map of two different things, um, you think that you can generalize from it. So then you, you run into somebody who you, you haven't read before, like uh, Nicholas Malbranche, who very few people here in the United States read. And he's, he's a rationalist, but he's not a rationalist in the same way that like Descartes, although he, he is a Cartesian, or Spinoza, or Leibniz, or uh, Arnaud were. Uh, instead, he's got his own weird thing going on that you, you really just got to read and find out about, you know? And, and you could do it through secondary texts. You could, like, read uh, somebody else telling you about what Malbranche has to say or Blaise Pascal or even Rene Descartes. Or you could read the actual texts. And when you're reading the actual texts, you're getting to see what the author, him or herself, really thinks about things, not what somebody else says that they think about things, which is much easier to, to wrap your head around, that they did some work for you, right? Mm -hmm. But they could, be, they could be wrong. And you never really know until you've read the original thinker whether this, first, this person over here telling you all about them is on point or full of it or somewhere in between, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I see a lot of people who... They, they do and th they think they have an accurate map and they've never actually checked it against anything. Mm 
Mm-hmm. So they know all about Rene Descartes and, you know, he, he was uh, this or he was that or he was this or Thomas Hobbes or pick whoever else you like. Uh, I mean, people do this today, too. They, they have their categories of, of people. Um, great example of this right now is critical race theory, right? It's this word that's getting bounced around mm-hmm. and you can say, oh, well, that's that's critical race theory. And, and then, you know, it's, it's, it's bad and you should ban it or don't allow people to teach about it or whatever, which is w- w- what's happening on the side of the the right and they're engaging in these really super sweeping generalizations of things that include you know it's like a giant box that includes basically anything that mentions race at this point right and can you successfully generalize about that in a way that would allow you to you know attain success in reaching you know intellectual truth or a representation of how things actually happened or even you know let's say you've got other things in mind like you know a lot of these laws will be like well we want to have you know we don't want people to be all riled up we want there to be harmony or concord or something like that are you really going to get that by using these these overly broad categories or boxes no you're 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 not going to and um so I see but, this but happening. They, I guess are they carrying that it is overly broad, is, uh, or are well, they being I think, pragmatic I think about their their ends that they're trying to achieve? That's a good question because there are some people who are involved in in that. Uh, I get to see this on Twitter quite a bit, who have come out and said we're just doing propaganda essentially against against what we're going to call critical race theory. We're succeeding because we have managed to get people to buy into the idea that there is such a thing as critical race theory as like a, a category of thinking, living, you know, stuff like that. And it is when bad. Things, it, well, exactly, yeah, yeah, because it stands in the way of whatever, whatever it is that you want. And interestingly, they will often make claims that they know are false about the falsity of what is being put forward as theory. Not to say that this only happens on the right. There are people on the left who do that as an argumentative strategy as well. Are they, are they really, so let's think about this. Are they really being pragmatic? They are in sort of a debased sense. They have mm-hmm. some... They have some things that they're after, like, you know, gaining political and cultural power. Is that going to be a long-term strategy for success? Or are they, are they doing so much damage to the very arena that they would like to dominate that they're, you know, it's, it, you know usually we talk about scorched earth as you retreat and you leave the earth scorched. Maybe they're actually wrecking things in the very area that they want to take over. Which is bad for all the rest of us who are part of that war, you know. Right. Yeah, and th- that's the whole idea that I had a problem with the the first definition here. What what are the terms oh. success? Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, huh. So maybe let's go to this SEP. Pragmatism is a philosophical tradition that broadly understands knowing the world as inseparable from agency within it. That's a nice one, isn't it? is I, I like like we the only reason that we have truth is because we are agents with minds that can discern yeah. truth um you know instead of like i guess the the argument is made that like we developed as humans not to know truth but to know what gets our gene pass genes passed down better and so you know our we will yeah this jump. darwinian sort of broadly darwinian yeah. notion right yeah you know like the whole i guess you see a, a stick on the path and you jump back because your brain thinks that it could be a snake and it's better to jump back and it not be a snake than to not jump back and it is a snake yeah. um i'm reminded of of all the silly things with uh, cats and cucumbers oh yeah right? they <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't go look that up on youtube it is yeah very entertaining um but is it their enter their a uh, distress uh, a good if it is uh, good for our entertainment what is the, well, the goal it, there right I, i'm just thinking about like cats wandering around and and seeing anything that's <laughs> snake-like and then you know recoiling from it um it's kind of you know in a way it's maladaptive isn't it 
yes, in the instant, but it is probably rather adaptive for the the long term okay. success of that that individual or that species. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So I don't. Know, I, can, I, would you talk about some of these uh, classical figures? Yeah, so when we talk about American pragmatism as a movement, we usually think we, there's like a, you know, like a trinity of them, you could say. Charles Sanders Peirce, who um, was not particularly successful in his life and actually had the term pragmatism, in his view, stolen by William James, who used it to mean something a bit different. So Peirce famously renamed his doctrine pragmaticism, saying that it's too ugly of a word for anyone else to steal. <laughs> and then we have John Dewey, uh, who I think a lot of people know less from philosophy and more from his uh, massive effect on American education. You know, or, you know, um, other things. And he's often viewed as, by, by people on the right, because he was for progressive education as, as being, you know, particularly problematic. Um, <clears throat> so those are the three big names, but there's a whole bunch of other people as well that, that get sort of mixed into it. And pragmatism, interestingly enough, Wait, did it, you it say also, William James? I did, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, James, uh, remember, stole the word from Purse. Oh, yes. Um, but there, there were people in Italy and in France and in other places who were embracing pragmatism. And James was like a big go-getter. He, he wandered around, you know, meeting these people. Um, the person who I actually wrote my um, dissertation on, Maurice Blondel, was a, a French 19th and 20th century uh, thinker. And he was willing to let people call what his philosophy of action, they were, he was willing to let them call it um, pragmatism until he found out what James meant by it. And then he was like, nope, don't, don't call me that. Because <laughs> what I'm doing is something kind of different. But there were a lot of these ideas kind of floating around in the air. Um, sometimes in the, in the present, the people who are continuing the pragmatist tradition will combine it with other traditions as well. Um, I mentioned Richard Rorty. Um, there's there's quite a few others in the present. It's part of the classical American tradition of philosophy. And there's a bit of diversity in what they thought truth was. Um, and I, I know a bit more about Peirce and James in part because I had so much Dewey kind of shoved down my throat when I was a graduate student at Southern Illinois University where they have the Dewey Center where I, I did actually work for a semester and all these Deweyans who, who you know, think that he's the best thing since sliced bread. That I had, I'll, ad, I'll admit that I'm not as up on Dewey um, since I'm almost 20 years out of graduate school. I haven't, I don't read Dewey very much. But, you know, when it comes to Person James, we see, we see some competing ideas. And I think that that understanding them can be helpful for us. Um, Peirce seemed to think, at least at one point, that truth is what we arrive at, at a sort of consensus um, way down the line. So it, it's like a, in a way, it's something we project out in front of us, <clears throat> which means that um, maybe we won't ever have truth with a capital T about some things, you know? Yeah. Uh, maybe maybe not, though. I, I mean, I was going to say political matters, but I think we've managed to have some progress that's been relatively lasting where we're, we've at least figured out some things. Mm -hmm. um, although, I don't know, we could always backslide. Yeah, and it might be that we will come to new, better truths. And so, like, our current political truths are right. are not, like, the ends, the, the final ends. Yeah, and you know, this is not what Peirce himself has said, but if you think about the importance of arriving at consensus, we're in a time where things are very fragmented, right? Mm -hmm. And we have this incredible political and cultural polarization. Um, people don't want to, like, you know, spend time with, date, talk to people from, from what they view as the other bad side. Um, we also have... In, pretty bad political gridlock. We're unable to get important things actually handled. You know, some people are like, yeah, we should have a, you know, we should have a constitutional amendment. There's no way we could ever pull that off in, mm -hmm. in this kind of environment. Um, it's just not going to happen. And on the really big things like environmental policy or, um, 
having you know a, a good healthcare system, it seems like we're we're kind of at impasses. And so, if we can't arrive at consensus, maybe our, there's you know there's nothing that says that our society has to continue to be on top of things. As a matter of fact, we seem to be in many respects quite quite in decline for for decades. Um, maybe if we look at things from a pragmatic perspective, our incredible factionalization is actually a sign of us being a bunch of losers. It's the opposite of success. <laughs> um, I don't know. That, that's, that's something to think about. Um, James talks about pragmatism as thinking about differences that make a difference. He says that all true processes must lead to the to the face of directly verifying sensible experiences somewhere. So, it, it, you know, there's there's the sense of pragmatism being a theory of meaning and, and being a theory of truth. Um, you can say, well, what do you actually mean by a term? And, and we can say, well, what what difference does, does it make to believe one thing or another? But there's also the sense in which um, if you can't say what would actually count as getting things right or success or making some sort of difference, you're really just talking about vacuous stuff and you probably don't realize that you're doing so. Um, for something to be true, there has to be a kind of robustness about affecting the world or, the, or it could be the world inside. It could be about how you feel about things. Um, right. There has to be some experiential like thing to map that. Yes, to. yes, yes. And, and the experience could be a lot of different things. You know, mm -hmm. it, it could be um, something very straightforward, like what happens in a spreadsheet that we do in Excel <laughs> right? uh, in terms of money that we're making. Or it could be um, how it corresponds to uh, what, he, what, you know, James calls our needs and desires or our volitional and passional nature. And so this is probably a place where we should you know, whatever worries we have about this pragmatist theory of truth, we should put them on the table because we're, we're getting close to the end of the the uh, hour. Um, mm. Do you have any qualms, well, I, worries about this? Or I guess the, the first one is how do we define, you know, it was one of the things from the, what is the success from er, yeah. early on? To te like, y yes, we can say like, oh, well, you know, I'm, um, uh, I've, Truth I've is gotten, what works, but what works, right? Yeah, what counts like, as working. Um, I, I don't want any immigrants in my town. Well, I guess you know you could. There are a number of ways you could do these things. A lot of them could be rather morally fraught. Right, the, the, right. Probably the vast majority of them are. Uh, but uh, if it, if your goal here was to, as I said, to get all the immigrants out of your town, then you know it might be pragmatic. Like that's the pragmatic truth of like how to get people out of your town this is where i think we could talk about um like you know sort of like a, pre a kernel and then like a bigger um thing that surrounds it you know mm -hmm. um success with a lowercase s might not correspond to success that takes into account other things that matter to us like not being dirtbags not being <laughs> people motivated by hate right maybe that's that so successes could conflict with each other right um, and, I, and i think that's that's a, a real issue um, I think we have to wrap up now. So, yeah. you want to lead us out? Yeah, so we leave you today with the words of Aristotle. Though we love both the truth and our friends, piety requires us to honor the truth first. 